Good morning. We're delighted you're able to join us for our webinar. This morning, we've assembled a panel of experts. We will be talking to James O'Sullivan, Senior Funds Policy Manager at the Central Bank of Ireland, who will be talking to us about the Commission's review of AIFMD. Here, we will be focusing on the question of delegation and liquidity management. My colleague, Sarah O'Reilly, partner in Mason Hayes and Kern's Investment Funds Practice, will discuss SFDR, the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, and will consider what lies ahead for the rest of the year. Adrian Whelan, Senior Vice President of Regulatory Intelligence at Brown Brothers Harriman, will outline emerging trends on the use of the LTIF, or the European Long-Term Investment Fund. And Adrian will also share his thoughts on the impact that Brexit is having on fund distribution. Lastly, I will mention the ILP and explain why I think this is a unique vehicle. We're covering a lot of ground this morning, therefore we plan to move at pace and to finish our presentation around 45 minutes time. We have a Q&A session at the end, so please submit your questions via the Q&A function. Turning to James O'Sullivan. James, in relation to the European Commission's review of AIFMD, probably the biggest question for the Irish funds industry regarding the Commission's review is that fund managers be permitted to continue as normal to delegate portfolio management to investment managers based in third countries. In its letter to the EU Commission, ESMA has suggested that the Commission would amend the Level 2 regulation to set out quantitative criteria that would list uh, the core activities or crucial functions that fund managers would need to perform themselves and not be permitted to delegate. What is the central bank's view on the question of delegation does the central bank think that the scope and extent of de to which fund managers are currently permitted to delegate ought to be modified? Thanks, Connor. And uh, I guess, firstly, uh, many thanks for inviting me to take part in this webinar. Uh, I'm looking forward to this morning's discussion. Uh, and as you said, we have lots of topics to get through. So in terms of this issue, obviously, it's been the primary focus of the AFMD review to date, I would say. Um, but as you'll be aware, the central bank published its response to the Commission's consultation. That consultation deals with a whole range of different issues. Um, and, and it's important, I think, then, therefore, to bear in mind that our view in the Central Bank of Ireland, and I think the view shared generally in terms of the AFMD review, is that the AFMD has had a positive impact overall. It has been effective in its core aims of regulating the alternative fund sector, increasing transparency via the Annex 4 reporting, etc. So um, I guess that's important because it's, it's uh, coloured our approach in terms of recommending that uh, changes be carefully considered. And we don't believe wholesale change is required to the AFMD. Instead, I think we would favor an incrementalist approach where we would target specific issues and, and think carefully about them. In terms of uh, delegation specifically, uh, you know, with the Irish industry, we have around 3,000 alternative investment funds uh, with about 800 billion in assets under management. Those funds, similar to USITs, do rely on delegation and, and do use delegation extensively. And we are very conscious of the benefits that that delegation can bring, both in terms of access to specialism, but also in terms of reducing costs and increasing efficiency. And those benefits to our mind still remain uh, very important. So that said, uh, we have long uh, focused our approach on making sure you have a substantive oversight and control of that delegation. And for us, if amendment is being considered to the AFMD review, that is where the primary focus should be. You mentioned Desma's uh, recent letter, and, and we, you know we were formed part of the drafting of that letter. And we, we have been very uh, upfront about the fact that we didn't agree with all the elements of the letter, particularly the proposals around delegation, which we thought if you move to a quantitative type approach, would result in a potential tick box exercise where simply because you have a certain percentage of your activity not delegated, 
therefore you would meet the requirements. And that is moving away from the existing approach in the AFMD review, which is much more focused on the relevant risks and making sure that there's an objective reason, for example, for delegation. So what we would favor instead is focusing on that substantive oversight and control by the uh, management company. Uh, we have made some recommendations in our response to the commission uh, in terms of it strengthening ESMA's role to ensure this consistent application of the existing rules. And that, to our mind, I think would be a much more effective outcome than uh, some of the proposals that we've heard from others. Um, th thank you for that. Um, the Euro European Commission, no doubt, will have heard various disparate representations regarding the question of delegation. Um, do you have a sense in relation to how that will be addressed by the Commission going forward? Yeah, um, it's it's a good question, but it is difficult to know at this point. Um, so the Commission, you know, are obviously making their way through the various responses to their consultation. I, I believe in the region of 130 responses have been received. Uh, so that's an extensive exercise in of itself. Um, I, I think we do need to be aware, notwithstanding the fact that we may not share the views of some other regulators or other member states around this issue, uh, nevertheless, there is a, a, a large minority of NCAs in particular, and, and then also member states more generally, that do think changes are required in this area. So I think we need to be cognizant of that fact and, and listen to those concerns and make uh, appropriate proposals for possible amendments, and hence my comments earlier. Uh, we have seen some public comments, obviously, in, in February from the Commission around not wanting to fundamentally change the existing approach or disrupt uh, firm business models, I think is what was said. But I, I do think they've left the door open for, for some amendments, and I would still expect there to be some amendments uh, to the FMD in this area. I suspect, but at this point it's hard to know, I suspect that might focus on a consistency between um, the AFMD and USITS rules, which was signaled in uh, ESMA's letter, for example. I also think the Commission will likely focus on how to um, get better or more consistent implementation of the current rules, which has been a concern of some regulators. So we may see an enhanced role for ESMA, for example, uh, at the moment, delegation decisions in relation to whether a third country meets the appropriate standard is left at a national competent authority level. You know, it's possible some change might be envisaged there. And I'm sure as we work through this process, uh, lots of other proposals will be put forward from, uh, you know, other member states, etc. So I suspect we will uh, be spending a lot of time looking at delegation when the uh, legislative negotiations start eventually. We're expecting a legislative proposal at the end of this year or into early next year from the Commission. So I suspect there will be a lot of detail to work through. From our perspective, what's key is that, yes, we need to address the concerns of others, but we need to do that in a manner which still retains a lot of the benefits I mentioned earlier around delegation. So I hope we can, I hope we can do that. Certainly a very important area and one that we'll be watching very, very closely. Uh, switching gears a little bit now, um, there's such a broad area covered by AIF and D review that we're not, it's not possible to deal with all of it. Um, but looking on, at the question of liquidity management, as you know, considerable work has been carried out by regulatory authorities, including ESMA and the Central Bank, regarding the assessment and use of liquidity management tools by fund managers. Recently, this body of work resulted in the Central Bank's letter of the 10th of March, which was addressed to a subset of fund managers who were surveyed as part of ESMA's coordinated review regarding their preparedness for, for future liquidity shocks. The fund managers who were surveyed were requested by the central bank to assess their liquidity management frameworks and where relevant they are required to update their liquidity management processes to take into account ESMA's findings. More generally fund managers who are not surveyed as you know were advised to note the central bank's letter. In light of ESMA's review and identification of shortcomings in relation to liquidity management what changes does the central bank expect fund managers to implement to their liquidity management frameworks and can we expect further developments in this area? 
Another good question, Connor. Uh, so I, I think, uh, as you indicated, this has been an area of regulatory scrutiny for quite some time. Uh, if, if we go back to uh, ESRB recommendations in this area in 2017, looking for a harmonized legal framework for liquidity management tools in the European Union, we also had IOSCO's updated liquidity management uh, recommendations in 2018, which are now subject uh, to an assessment by IOSCO and IOSCO has issued a survey in that regard and I would encourage uh, all market participants to try to respond to that voluntary survey, it's, it's available on their website. Um, so it has been an area of focus uh, in, your, in, Europe, in Europe, internationally and domestically. Uh, it, uh, in the Central Bank of Ireland, we've issued three communications on this in 2019, 2020, and most recently uh, the communication you mentioned uh, to a subset of fund management companies. We've published that letter on our website. And as you say, we, we do think it's important that all fund management companies uh, note the contents of that letter. Uh, the reason we're focusing on this issue and regulators generally are focusing on it is because effective liquidity management is important for a whole host of things, including investor protection, market integrity, and reducing systemic risk, which in our view, all of which in our view, um, mitigates or reduces financial stability concerns. And that's important from our perspective as a central bank, because we are looking at it not only from the perspective of investor protection or conduct risks for in individual funds, but we're also looking at it from a system-wide perspective in terms of potential financial stability risks. Uh, and along those lines, obviously last year in, in March and April, due to the COVID shock, uh, fund liquidity was an area of particular focus. And that broadly split into two groups. One was money market funds that had their own particular difficulties given the nature of those funds. But the, the second, and I think very striking finding for us out of that period was that funds with less liquid assets were much more likely to be susceptible to redemptions um, and we're not talking about challenges in meeting redemptions, but actually in increased redemption requests compared to more liquid funds, even though those funds that are invested in, in liquid equities, for example, were subject to um, increased asset pressure. It was actually the funds that were invested in less liquid assets, even though they're those assets weren't coming under valuation issues. Uh, it, nevertheless, it was those funds that were subject to increased redemption pressures. And to our mind, and I think the mind of a lot of regulators at the moment, what that points to is potential first mover advantage dynamics, where there is a, a belief that investors will try to move more quickly than some of their counterparts and redeem uh, when a, a shock first hits. Now, that is concerning to us for a few different reasons. Uh, both in terms of the remaining investors that are left in the fund and the potential dilution effects that can occur if you're redeeming the most liquid assets uh, to fund those redemption requests, but then also the pressure that that can bring from a systemic point of view where you do have a concern that funds may amplify the shocks that are being felt more widely in the market. Um, so with that in mind, our, our most recent communication focuses on that issue. What we are encouraging fund management companies to do are look at measures to affect those dilution effects and reduce the first mover advantage dynamics. We've pointed to anti-dilution levies as swing pricing as being particularly important in that regard, but we haven't necessarily mandated or suggested particular tools be used. At this point, what's very important is the fund management companies consider these issues in line with their other obligations and seek to address those uh, dynamics. We do have a, a large cohort of funds, particularly those invested in less liquid assets that currently deploy swing pricing and anti-dilution levies or dual pricing, for example, as ways of mitigating this. But there is nevertheless a sizable cohort of the market that don't employ these tools. And I think the regulator is likely to be asking more questions in this regard in the future about why some funds don't put in place those measures. Uh, and in terms of potential um, steps we might take at this point, you know, I think it is important that IOSCO is working on this issue. There is a group at the moment looking at the behavior funds of last March and April uh, and, and focusing on, on the issue of liquidity management and open-ended funds generally. So again, there is international work underway here at present. James, that's very interesting. Um, I, I note the comments there in relation to it. So 
uh, you've heard it first, uh, liquidity management insure and ensuring that you have a full set of liquidity management tools focusing on anti-dilution levies, swing pricing, side pockets, uh, and ultimately investor suspensions. They're all matters that are going to be in, need to be in the, in, in the tool set of fund managers. But liquidity management is not the only matter that fund managers will need to address uh, for the next six months. So at this stage, I'd like to turn to my colleague, Sarah O'Reilly, who will talk to us about SFDR and outline what lies ahead for the rest of the year. Thank you, Connor, and hello, everyone. Before getting into the detail about what lies ahead for the SFDR, I just wanted to take a step back and remind ourselves that the aim of the SFDR is to increase transparency within the financial markets in relation to sustainability. The SFDR is all about enhanced disclosure to investors in a standardised way to com combat so-called greenwashing. Many of our fund clients and the fund industry in general is seeing significant interest in inflows from investors into ESG products, accelerated by the current pandemic. The enhanced disclosures required by the SFDR will ultimately give investors the information they need to continue to direct investments towards ESG products. Many of our clients, and I'm sure many of you, are now breathing a sigh of relief as the 10th of March SFDR deadline has passed. We have been very busy advising clients on updates to websites and filing prospectuses for them with the central bank in time to comply with the level one requirements that came into force on the 10th of March. However, unfortunately, SFDR day on the 10th of March is not the end of the SFDR compliance journey there is still more to do. Due to the sense of urgency around sustainability, compliance with the SFDR on a high level and principal basis from the 10th of March was based on level one text only. This was because level two regulatory technical standards setting out the detailed requirements on content and presentation were delayed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The final draft level two regulatory technical standards were published by the three ESAs on the 4th of February 2021 and the European Commission is expected to endorse the draft level two RTS by the beginning of May. To allow sufficient time to prepare, the ESAs have recommended to the European Commission that the detailed level two requirements will become applicable from the 1st of January 2022. What this has meant in practice is that there is a two-stage compliance process for the SFDR. The first stage was compliance with the substantive level one requirements that came into effect on the 10th of March. This, as you know, necessitated updates to disclosures on websites and in fund prospectuses on a high level and principal basis. The second stage now will be compliance with the more detailed disclosure requirements set out in level two. So what are the requirements set out in level two? Level two contains detailed requirements, firstly on website disclosures related to principal adverse impacts of investment decisions on sustainability factors. And secondly, pre-contractual and website disclosures for Article 8 light green funds, which are funds that promote environmental or social characteristics and Article 9 dark green funds which are funds with a sustainable investment objective. Interestingly, some of the disclosures required by level one will not be updated by level two. The requirements to publish on the manager's website a policy on sustainability risks and updates to remuneration policies for, for sustainability risks is principle based and will not be further clarified in level two. Also, the Article 6 Level 1 required disclosures in all prospectuses on the integration of sustainability risks into the investment process and likely impact on returns will not need to be updated either any further for Level 2, as that was also principle based. Okay, so I'm going to look firstly at the website disclosures on principal adverse impacts under Level 2. 
From the 10th of March 2021, managers for companies with less than 500 employees were required to publish on their website information on the principal adverse impacts of investment decisions on sustainability factors, or explain the reasons why it does not consider such adverse impacts. For larger firms with more than 500 employees, the compliance deadline was actually the 30th of June rather than the 10th of March 2021. Level two requires the principal adverse impact disclosure on managers' websites to be updated to take the form of a statement showing how investments adversely impact certain indicators now specified in level two. So next, looking at the product level pre-contractual disclosures, namely, namely the updates required to be made to prospectuses under level two. Level two now contains pre-contractual disclosure templates for light and dark green funds. Prospectuses will need to be updated to include the disclosure templates as an annex to the prospectus. Unfortunately, level two provides little scope for modifying the disclosure templates. Prospectuses must be prepared in accordance with the level two template, which sets out the order, subheadings and content. In addition, updates need to be made to product level website disclosures. Level one required managers to disclose certain product information on their website sites for each light green and dark green fund. Level two now specifies where and how managers must publish the information on the website. Although the requirements are detailed, the good news is there is no disclosure or reporting templates in level two, allowing managers some flexibility in crafting their own website disclosures. So I've explained the level two updates that must be made to websites and prospectuses. I now wanted to touch briefly on the SFDR provisions with later application dates that did not come into effect on the 10th of March. These were the requirements relating to periodic reports and disclosure of principal adverse impacts at fund level in the prospectus. In terms of periodic reports, the new disclosure requirements imposed by the SFDR for light and dark green products do not come into effect until the 1st of January 2022. This, I think, dovetails nicely with the proposed implementation date of Level 2, particularly given the additional Level 2 sustainability disclosures required in periodic reports. Level 2 requires the provision of quantitative and qualitative indicators using the mandatory reporting templates contained in level two and integrated in an annex to the existing periodic reports. So turning to the principal adverse impact disclosures at fund level in the prospectus, where a manager prepares a principal adverse impact statement, the SFDR requires that by the 30th of December, 2022 at the latest, certain prescribed disclosures are included in the prospectus. And where the manager does not consider principal adverse impacts, a statement to that effect and the reasons why must be disclosed in the prospectus. However, just to note again, these disclosures are based on level one text only. So just to sum up what lies ahead for the SFDR, the detailed level two requirements will require firms to update website disclosures relating to principal adverse impacts. For light green and dark green funds, websites and prospectuses will need to be updated to include the requirements contained in level two by the 1st of January, 2022. That assumes that the implementation date of 1st of January, 2022 is, appro is approved by the European Commission. For non-ESG funds, there will be no far further updates required to comply with level two. However, all prospectuses, if not already updated, will need to be updated by the 30th of December, 2022, to disclose principal adverse impacts at fund level or explain why not re relevant. So as you can see, there is still a considerable body of work to be done but ultimately, as I said at the outset, the enhanced disclosures required by the SFDR 
will give investors the information they need to continue to direct investments towards environmentally sustainable products. Which, given the huge level of investor appetite for ESG products at the moment, can only be a good thing for the investment funds industry. I will now hand back to Connor, who will discuss fund structuring, in particular the new investment limited partnership and emerging trends. Thanks, Sarah. Certainly a lot of uh, information and more work to be done uh, by fund managers in relation to SFDR. And it's no doubt going to be a very active area for us over the next uh, nine, nine months at the very least and beyond that, in indeed. Um, in relation to the ILP, there's been a number of webinars in relation to the ILP which discuss the changes made to Irish partnership legislation. What I'd like to discuss uh, today are the features of the ILP that distinguish it from partnership vehicles of other domiciles and to explain why I think the ILP is a unique vehicle. Uh, firstly, the ILP is a regulated alternative investment fund and its status as a regulated fund means that it is suitable for distribution to institutional investors in Europe who sometimes are restricted on the extent to which they can allocate to unregulated collective investment vehicles. An ILP established as a QAIF or Qualifying Investor Alternative Investment Fund is normally subject to the central bank's 24-hour approval process. And therefore, the authorization timeframe for an ILP is a lot quicker when compared to other regulated funds. We also note that it may be beneficial from a tax perspective for certain investors to invest through a regulated fund as opposed to an unregulated vehicle. When we take these features together in relation to the ILP's regulated status, we see that firstly, the regulated status allows for greater distribution opportunities. Secondly, there's the potential for beneficial tax treatment. And thirdly, the quick authorization timeframe means that the ILP has substantial benefits. Um, and another uh, unique feature of the ILP is that it can be established as an umbrella fund. In this regard, this is regarded as an efficient way to structure an investment vehicle because it allows for the creation of different sub funds that pursue different investment strategies. Importantly, the ILP Act establishes that each sub fund has segregated liability. A practical benefit of the umbrella ILP is that sub funds can invest in a different manner. For example, one sub fund could be used to invest directly in underlying assets for investors who require tax transparency, whereas a second sub fund could be established with an intermediate holding vehicle for investors who require a tax opaque structure. We have advised clients on these types of structuring arrangements in the context of the Irish 1907 partnership, and we expect these and further variations to be developed uh, with the ILP. The ILP can also be used uh, to establish a global distribution platform. In this regard, it can be established with a mix of corporate or tax transparent feeder funds that may be established in domiciles such as Delaware or the Cayman Islands. Another unique feature of the ILP Act is that it establishes a statutory framework for the migration of partnerships into and out of Ireland. This framework operates broadly in the same way that a corporate fund can re-domicile into Ireland as an ICAV. A key benefit of migrating a foreign partnership is that the partnership continues its legal existence and can retain its track record. As you know, the benefit of establishing a partnership in Ireland is the ability to avail of the marketing passport under AIFMD. Looking now to the status of the ILP, an ILP is formed as a common law partnership. Indeed, Section 4 of the ILP Act clarifies that the old Partnership Act of 1890, and indeed the rules of common law and equity apply to an ILP, except to the extent that common law principles are inconsistent with the ILP Act. What this means is that common law principles on matters such as the fiduciary duties of the general partner or principles relating to a conflict of interest apply to an ILP. In this regard, an ILP should look and feel broadly similar to a Cayman or Delaware partnership vehicle that fund sponsors will be familiar with. In relation to the limited partners, the limited partners or investors in the ILP have limited liability, which means that the limited partners will, be not, will not be liable for the debts of the partnership beyond the amount that they have contributed to the partnership. The limited liability for limited partners is granted on the basis that the limited partners will not take part in the conduct of the business of the ILP. 
Helpfully, the ILP sets out a non-exhaustive list of activities. These are so-called safe harbour activities that the limited partners may carry out, such as serving on the board of an advisory committee or consulting with the general partner in relation to the business of the partnership whilst preserving their limited liability status. An ILP can be established with a dual foreign name. This is a unique or novel feature. As a consequence, an ILP can be registered overseas, for example, in China uh, or other markets with a foreign name. In relation to tax treatments, there's a couple of points to be said around this. An ILP, like other partnership vehicles, is tax transparent and therefore the income and gains of an ILP are deemed to arise directly in the hands of the limited partners. However, an ILP does not incur any taxes at the level of the partnership, such as a subscription tax, which may, be, which may apply in other jurisdictions. In addition, the management services that are provided to an ILP should, from an Irish perspective, be exempt from Irish VAT, and indeed the scope of exemption under the Irish VAT rules may be broader when compared to other domiciles. Lastly and most importantly, an ILP will be domiciled in Ireland, which is a centre of excellence for the management and administration of investment funds. This means that an ILP can avail of the excellent service standards and choose from a broad selection of experts in the Irish market. An ILP can be established with a low cost structure for a regulated fund vehicle, and indeed there are additional service providers who are coming to the Irish market, for in particular, uh, depositories of real assets. Uh, the benefit of the ILP is, is also uh, the fact that it benefits from a clear and well-defined regulatory framework in Ireland, which is set out in the central bank's AIF rulebook. And lastly, sponsors who establish in Ireland can benefit from the ease of doing business that Ireland has to offer. We think that the mix of all of these features such as its status as a regulated fund, the tax transparency that it brings, the product features in relation to segregated liability means that the ILP is a unique vehicle that will be popular for asset managers. Our clients who have invested in real estate assets, particularly who have invested also in credit funds, are looking at the ILP with interest. And what strikes them is, and our overall feedback that we receive is the extensive flexibility that managers perceive the ILP provides. In relation to popular vehicles, I know that Adrian Whelan has some thoughts in relation to the rising popularity of the ELTIF, which is the European Long-Term Investment Fund, Infrastructure Fund, and the reasons why the ELTIF has been much overlooked is receiving renewed interest. Adrian, if you could share your thoughts on that matter, that would be uh, of tremendous interest. Sure, Connor, and thanks. Um, some people might raise their eyebrows um, Now I'm back on. Um, yeah, some people might raise their eyebrows at LTIF being raised, but it actually builds on a number of things that, that, that's been discussed. So the ILP in Ireland just gives greater optionality to investor appetite and demand. Um, when James spoke earlier, he spoke about the AFMD review and fund liquidity. There's a few things just converging. Um, the LTIF is a subset of the Capital Markets Union, the EU initiative which at its core wants to build, one of, the, one of its initiatives is to get non-bank financing into the real economy. And interestingly, as we look at the options available to EU investors and beyond, at the moment, you primarily have two, two options. You have um, liquid usits to this side and more liquid AFMD funds. As we look at the horizon, the investment and, and the macro environment of negative interest rates, fund liquidity, the funding needs of the real economy, government's inability to spend because they're tapped out and investor appetite, there might be room for this middle ground. And you're right to say that the LTIF has been available since 2015 and there's less than 30 in the market. That's because the rule set, actually, it's been an option, but a bad option. Um, there's an open consultation there, which actually in the investor permission, so what it can invest in is a little bit better. Um, who it can distribute to and the distribution parameters is a little bit better. 
Like the ILP, though, and James might have comments on this, but like the ILP, it's important that the local implementation of the rules on tax, its interaction with other regulations like AFMD and, and MIFID and, and, and point of sale regulation is important. But I would like to put it on everybody's radar. We're already seeing in the European DC pension space and what's called the mass affluent market, so maybe private bank clients, we're already seeing, even with the suboptimal LTIF uh, regime in place, that we're seeing funds launch with LTIF. So primarily an LTIF launching an asset manager and a private bank in Germany or in Italy, primarily um, JVing on that product and supplying a fund with this liquidity middle ground and with asset classes that they want that don't fit neatly into the use its wrapper and may be constrained from distributing in the AFMD wrapper. So I would um, urge everybody to look at uh, the industry responses on LTIF or LTIF 2.0, the high level expert group. And um, I think LTIF is actually gonna find its place now when it becomes available and when we have the better rule set. I think there's a huge latent demand there for this middle ground in terms of investment capability and distribution uh, to the DC uh, pension scheme space and to the mass affluent market. So again, it, it definitely is one to watch. And Connor, I'll just hand it back to, to you, uh, very conscious of time. Thanks, Adrian. It's it's very interesting to hear. When you first mentioned the LTIF, I thought, well, there's nothing really to see here, but very conscious that we should have that on our radar and be looking out for the popularity of that vehicle as, as, as the year progresses. Uh, of course, we can't get away from the topic of Brexit, so ever prevailing on our minds. And we're reaching, of course, at this stage, the end of the first quarter um, in the post-Brexit environment. Can you explain what impact Brexit is having on the distribution for investment funds? Yeah, it's a good point. So everybody's waiting for the white smoke on the financial services deal. That's still uh, pending, but again, it's supposed to come out before the end of this month. Uh, interestingly, Brexit, I think everyone would agree, has largely come and gone without mass disruption. Uh, that's because there was a number of contingencies that were put in place. There was also a number of things already in train, as we know, in an Irish context that CP86 and substance and Brexit planning meant that a lot of uh, UK firms in particular decamped, maybe set up with their own manco in Ireland or with a third party management company or found Brexit solutions. That's not to say that it has been seamless. Obviously the decoupling of Europe or the EU and the UK and primarily the city of London was gonna have some friction points. Uh, one of the major friction points was always going to be the fact that global managers use London in particular as a distribution hub. So no matter what they were doing, a US manager normally had a MIFID entity in the UK who perhaps was their sales, marketing and distribution arm for multiple things. So it could be their use it, it could be their F&D funds, segregated mandates, sub-advisory. And actually it's the lack of a financial deal and a lack of equivalence, particularly for MIFID, which has created some tensions. You may have seen, again, last month or the month before, ESMA actually put out a warning shot to UK firms around uh, sales, marketing, distribution, MIFID, and reverse solicitation. And that was because, again, certain UK entities and platforms were kind of carrying on regardless. So they'd always had access to the uh, EU market. They already had existing clients and they continue to engage with those clients. But again, there's very hard and fast rules. So some of the helpful contingencies that were put in place previously and the most helpful one for Irish entities, Irish funds wanting to access the, the UK market was the temporary permissions regime. So again, the FCA and the UK wanted to continue for a period of time, allowing EEA, EU access of entities and particularly funds into the UK market. The UK market is a huge, remains a huge uh, distribution market, particularly for use its funds, for Irish funds. Um, and that was continued through the TPR. Interestingly, not everyone got the memo on the TPR. 
So again, there were some funds that even when the, the transition date went, maybe they were the ultimate optimists that thought that it would be resolved, there'd be a deal put in place, but not all um, mancos, asset managers or funds had all their funds enter the TPR. So when we entered into uh, January 1st and they noticed that this distribution supply line had been slightly disrupted, they wanted to add their funds in, but it was too late. The other entities that would have been impacted is actually funds that launched this year. So they might have been in with the central bank prior and um, just again through no fault of anybody's, but the timeline for authorizations that those funds were only fully authorized January of this year. So they weren't eligible for the TPR either. So what's happened to some funds and some entities, not just in Ireland, just elsewhere, is that without being inside the TPR or the TMP or the temporary um, marketing permissions regime, you need to put your fund into a more long-winded version, which is basically under what's called Section 272. So if you weren't in the TPR, which can carry on regardless on, in terms of fund authorizations for distribution into the UK, you're into this longer-winded, more bureaucratic, more form-filling, like any other third country fund in the world would have. So you lose your special status that use its funds particularly had under TPR. And um, you also have to wait for the FCA to give you what's called a landing spot. So again, there's a number of clients out there still waiting. Uh, they have a fund, it's launched, it's Irish authorized with the CBI, for example, and they want to distribute in the UK, but they're still waiting again for the FCA's authorization and blessing to do that. So again, we have some uh, fund launches that have been delayed, that are waiting, that are uncertain. And I just bring that up because that's going to be over the longer term, perhaps the new normal. Brexit has happened. Everything's not going to continue as, as, as it has been previously in, in a pretty seamless uh, environment. The other important thing is that the TPR, the clue is in the name. It's a temporary permissions regime. And one thing I'll, I'll touch on very briefly is that there is a life cycle, five years to the, to the TPR, but the UK is already working towards a new regime. So us as Irish entities and us as services of Irish funds, the new offshore fund regime, OFR, another acronym for the mix, that's going to come into play. It's under consultation at the moment. And again, because the UK is such an important um, market, there's an open consultation. I think that people that have an interest in the UK market should engage on that consultation. Again, that will be a regulatory equivalence regime, and that's going to be interesting again, because an equivalence regime where the FCA takes an opinion on, again, third country funds from their perspective. Um, will there be divergence? Will it become more complex? Will it become contentious and political? Will the UK wish to incentivize purchase of UK domicile funds, maybe over offshore funds. These are all things when the OFR and the TPR winds down, the OFR becomes applicable, will become more important and we should all stay attuned to it. The other thing I'd say more on the positive is that the Use Its brand is so well recognized in the UK market um, that they want to retain access to it. I believe that. And again, there's two pockets where the UK just can't lose access to it. And Ireland has a, a kind of a relative advantage. That's exchange traded funds, where the UK have gone through a fund review. They may want to be an ETF uh, domicile, but I don't think they can ever challenge the, the, the primacy of Ireland and use its ETFs. And money market funds. Again, Ireland has a, a very strong franchise in money market funds. The UK, to build that from zero, will be very difficult. So I fully think the continuation of use its into the UK will happen. It just won't be as seamless as it is now. The other interesting thing in the UK market at the moment is that they did freeze and take on a number of EU regulations and grandfather them. So there's two versions of use it's in the UK market now. And we've had a couple of uh, kind of funny, confusing instances where you have UK use it's and you have EEA use it's. So proper use it's as we know, cross border funds under use it's that's continued to sell into the market. But also there's a UK version, a closed circuit uh, distribution of UK use it's. UK wanted to hold on in the UK use its brand within their OIX market, because again, the franchise of use its is so strong and intuitive to uh, IFAs, to fund platforms, that again, it's just funny uh, nuance of, of, of post-Brexit that we have two versions of use its in the UK market now, UK and EEA. I'll go back now actually to say about the, the wrinkles and the ESMA and reverse solicitation. 
what we're also seeing is that a number of clients did solve for their management company issues. So they set up um, in an EU member state and a lot came to Ireland and have a, an Irish use its Manco or an AFA Manco or Super Manco doing both. Some have MIFID top ups, but in essence, they've lost uh, access at times to their MIFID hub in the UK. So again, a number of people, as we know, are going through contractuals with third party marketing firms or tied agencies. Some are um, chaperoning. Some have seconded some of their sales staff from the UK into Irish firms. And this is because, with all due respect, some MIFID firms are here. But again, in the Manco market, it is a contractual and substance entity that can help with, with, with further distribution. But it's not particularly a sales and marketing uh, sales force. So again, there's been some tensions around access to EU clients um, through MIFID. And again, when you go to countries like Italy or Netherlands or to EU pension schemes, they're not so compelled to contract with a use its firm, an a and firm. It has to be a MIFID and not a MIFID top-up without going into the technicalities. So the loss of the UK MIFID distribution engine has just resulted in contractual repapering and again, access to talent. That's just going to be recalibrated and dispersed a little differently. The other interesting thing, if you look at Boval put out an interesting report, there's over 100 EU asset managers awaiting licenses in the UK. So as we've seen the UK entities look to decamp and set up outposts in the EU, similarly, the UK local market, again, institutional uh, entities, uh, DC pension schemes, want to contract with an FCA authorized MIFID firm. So we've seen EU firms look to set up camp and a little, do a little bit more in the UK. So I think that dispersion of, of, of distribution capabilities is going to be a continued area of focus. And I do think that ESMA will continue to look very strongly at things like reverse solicitation, whether UK firms are acting in accordance with their own permissions and, and EU uh, permissions. The other thing I would say is that the offshore fund regime, go back to that, the divergence or the convergence of the EU uh, rules that, and, and the Irish rules and the UK is going to continue to be interesting. Sarah spoke about SFDR. So just from a distribution point of view, to come in hugely important as a hygiene factor to selling funds across the EU and in the UK. The UK plan to put in their own ESG rules, but not comply with SFDR. So it's just an interesting, you're going to have to compare and contrast EU funds, use it primarily to UK OIC funds. They'll have the same type of rules, but not the same. So will investor appetite in uh, the UK be swayed towards favour for the SFDR use it or the UK ESG use it. Again, these are things we all need to stay finely attuned to. I think, again, it's been great that we have the contingencies in place. I think it's great that UK entities have continued to have a certain amount of access to EU markets. Um, but it's very important for Irish funds industry that we stay involved and engaged at industry level to ensure that the supply chain and the supply route into the UK is maintained because it's a huge and will remain a huge um, distribution channel for Irish funds. So again, a lot going on there. Happy to discuss it with anybody who has questions offline. But I do think the distribution impacts of Brexit um, will remain with us throughout this year and on. And, and I'll pass back to you, Connor. Adrian, that's fascinating. Thanks for that. And it's very interesting to hear about the bifurcation of the market, Europe versus the UK. And in addition to that, the tension in relation to access to European investors, which is a theme that we're hearing about uh, and will continue to, to evolve over the next number of months. I'm conscious uh, that there have been a number of questions that have come through the Q&A function, and I wanted to uh, address those now in our Q&A session. Um, James, we have a question coming in, um, and this one is one I'll, I'll direct to you, if, if I may. Um, with the implementation of the ILP, does the central bank view the entrance of a number of real asset depositories into the market? Do, do you view that as a positive step? And when are we likely to uh, see the first authorization come through on that license? 
A topical question. So, um, as you know, we, the central bank, issued guidance around DAO fees or uh, depositories of assets other than financial instruments is what we've taken to calling them, but uh, specialised depositories, real asset depositories, and so on. Um, so we issued that guidance in February. I would expect an authorization uh, and potentially multiple authorizations to be forthcoming quite quickly. Um, there, are, there have been a number of applications in the pipeline for some time. Uh, from our perspective, you know, I think it, it's a it's a nice complement to the existing regulatory framework that we have there. You know, important for the audience to be aware that uh, DAO fees can only uh, act for certain types of AFES. So those AFES that are closed ended for a period of five years um, and that do not generally invest in financial instruments. And finally, I would say just again, important that the DAO fees obligations, and I guess one of the things we thought very closely about when putting the framework in place is that they, they don't change in terms of their oversight obligations of the funds, et cetera. So they're, they're still, uh, we still place a great deal of importance on the DAO fee, notwithstanding that it is a slightly more tailored service for those AFES, but hopefully will result in lower costs ultimately to investors uh, and so on. Thanks for that, James. We have a question in relation to the soon to be announced EU UK Brexit deal. Um, Adrian, I might direct this question to you. Is it likely that that soon to be announced Brexit deal on financial services might resolve any of the existing distribution uh, frictions that, that you mentioned? In a word, no, uh, because again, a lot, again, how, how funds are bought and sold in Europe, just very generally, is contingent on MIFID permissions. And MIFID has equivalency built in, but will MIFID equivalency be granted to the UK? There's a big question mark over that. And again, it goes back to the fact that it has become quite a politicized argument. And so the answer is a question mark. I don't know, but if I was voting today and, and to the pin in my collar, which I think I am, um, I would say, no, it won't be resolved. And again, people are, are making their own decisions in advance of that. And again, setting up either third party arrangements or their own entities, similar to, to, to what they did with management companies for MIFID distribution capabilities. Because again, equivalency is not a great bedrock. Again, it, it you know, it's, it's, it's temporary, it's, it's, it's dynamic. So people are generally making decisions to contract with, with EU entities. Yeah, I, I think that that's the, 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 the view. I mean, people may have been hopeful, shall we say, initially, but certainly the dawning realisation of, of the new post-Brexit environment is, is, is here to stay. Um, Sarah, we have a question that I might direct to, to you, and this relates to the ILP. Will the fact that the ILP is a regulated vehicle delay the uh, setup or authorization timeframe. What's your thoughts in relation to that? Well, I suppose most of these, uh, most of the ILPs are going to be set up as quaifs, and quaifs can avail of the 24 hour fast track approval process with the central bank. So if the documents are filed, the material contracts prospectus and other letters and forms required by the central bank, if they're filed by 3 p.m. on the day prior to authorization, the authorization will come through the following day. But just to point out, the central bank does require a pre-submission be made for certain types of vehicles, such as real estate, um, highly leveraged vehicles, loan origination, and life settlement. Yeah, thank, thanks for that, uh, Sarah. Maybe a question that I might direct, which relates to the SFDR. Um, and maybe if I ask you this question, will the central bank be putting in place a fast tracked filing process for the SFDR level two prospectus updates, uh, similar to what it did for, for level one. So uh, I, guess, I guess, firstly, this is an issue we're looking at. We do want to provide clarity one way or another quite quickly. So I, I suspect we will we will try to do that. Um, you know, I think Sarah summed it up well when she when she in her earlier remarks pointed out that the requirements in the level two are focused on a subset of the, the overall population. So disclosures accompanying adverse sustainability impacts and disclosures relevant for Article 8 and Article 9 products. So we are dealing with a different magnitude in terms of the overall impact uh, 
And I, and I also, it's important to say that we put a fast track process in place, taking into account the uh, lack of clarity about the level two. And generally our approach is to review the documentation related to retail funds, particularly prospectus and, and pre-contractual disclosures generally. So I, I think it's fair to say we are unlikely to see a fast track process uh, for the level two, though the, the details will have to be announced because it is obviously a challenge when dealing with this level of amendment both for industry in terms of trying to make the changes and also for the regulator in terms of reviewing that level of documentation. So I, I expect we'll make an announcement quite sh shortly in terms of what, what we might put in place. Thanks for that, James. We have a further question and this relates to liquidity management and um, the, the, the role of the NCAs. Um, James, would you be able to speak to uh, the criteria and uh, the issues involved from an NCA or central bank perspective in terms of uh, suspending a particular uh, theme or, 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 or category of investment funds given the new or, or powers to be developed under, under, under the, 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 the recommendation as proposed by ESMA. So um, I, I guess this isn't a new issue. It's certainly one that the, we looked at very closely in, in terms of Brexit previously around our Brexit preparations. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, our view would be that the primary obligation rests with the fund manager. You know, they are responsible for managing those funds. And if there's a reason that those funds would need to suspend, that should be taken by the fund manager in the first instance. Um, that said though, and I alluded to this in my remarks earlier, because of the increased size of the fund sector and non-bank sector generally, we are increasingly thinking about the collective impact of funds. So to put that another way, what might look like a very rational decision at an individual fund manager level taken in a system-wide context may actually have the wrong results. So if you have a very large fund continuing to sell into a downward market, that may have wider implications than just for that fund or, or fund manager. Uh, our AFMD currently provides powers to regulators to step in and suspend AFES. Article 46 of the directive does that. We updated our domestic transposition in 2019 because it didn't fully reflect the FMD. So that was a mistake that was spotted and amended. And what that does is give regulators the ability to suspend in the public interest. Uh, as part of the FMD review, we've said it would be useful to have greater clarity around the public interest. But to our mind at the Central Bank of Ireland, that includes financial stability implications potentially. So um, not a new issue, but a topic I suspect will be subject to lots of discussion over the next few months and years. Thanks, James. We have had a number of questions that have come through. Unfortunately, we won't be able to get uh, through to them all. Um, I'd like to thank everybody, for all the attendees, for their, their presentation. Uh, for those of you who have addressed questions and have left your names, we'll endeavour to get back to you. I'd uh, like to thank our guest speakers, James O'Sullivan from the Central Bank and Adrian Whelan from Brown Brothers Harriman, who I'm sure you'll agree were excellent. I'd also like to thank uh, my colleague Sarah O'Reilly on her presentation as well, which was excellent. If you have follow up queries regarding our talk today, please feel free to contact myself or Sarah. For those of you um, who uh, attended, you'll be sent a survey request. Uh, we would ask you to complete the survey, which amongst other questions will ask you to identify what topics you would like us to cover in a future webinar. Lastly, Mason Hayes and Curran is hosting its financial services summer, or rather spring briefing webinar later this week, which is on Thursday at 11 a.m. Our keynote speaker for that webinar will be Seamus Coffey. He's the former chair of the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council, and he will be giving his insights on the state of the economy and indeed on the impact of COVID, as well as the likely performance of the economy in 2021. So uh, please uh, do drop us a line or check out our website for, for details in relation to the registration for that event. With that, I'd like to thank you all for your attendance and wish you all the best for the rest of the day. Thank you.